Good afternoon, and welcome to the BSI Standards e-conference session on organizational resilience. My name is David Adamson, and I'm a Standards Development Manager at BSI. It's my pleasure to welcome you and introduce our panelists. As you see from the first slide, our six panelists will consider a very topical and broad mix of topics, including crisis management, business continuity management, spontaneous volunteers and vulnerable people, resilience and city resilience, and management systems. Our panelists will each have 10 minutes for their presentations, which really isn't a lot of time to introduce the subjects. And the free related standards as well that BSI is currently making available for a limited time. But we've asked them to include, as well as their presentations in them, any experience and any tips in light of COVID-19 if they can. There will be Q&A after the presentations. So feel free to ask questions by using the Q&A bar and address it to a particular panelist if that's easier for you. Um, the slides and the panelist bios will be available after this session, but, but please allow me to introduce each of our panelists for you briefly now. Kevin Breer is a consulting director at Exina Consulting and the firm's client service lead for crisis management and business continuity matters. Kev has previously held roles as a practice leader for crisis management and cyber resilience, as a third party risk lead, an information risk manager, resilience manager, and information security group team leader. Prior to these roles, Kev was a police officer in the city of London police. So Kev is a convener for the European and ISO groups working on the crisis management. Rick Cudworth, partner, advisory services at Deloitte. Rick has spent 25 years of his career advising organizations in the private and public sector in dealing with crises and enhancing organizational resilience. He was responsible for leading the global response to the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and was also a member of the Cabinet Office Business Advisory Network for Pandemic Flu. Rick is the chair of the BSI committee responsible for business continuity management and resilience. In addition, he's a principal expert at ISO. Malcolm Cornish, director at MRI Limited. Malcolm is ISO project leader who led the development of both editions of ISO 22313. This is the guidance standard for 22301 on business continuity management systems requirement standard. Malcolm has specialized in business continuity management for more than 30 years in industry and as an independent consultant. And he has been a member of the BSI BS, BCM committee since its inception in 2005. So this is a group that did 25999, if you remember. Duncan Shaw. Duncan Shaw is a professor in operational research and critical systems at the University of Manchester where he works in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. His interests include social and decision-making aspects of disaster planning and response, including community resilience. The Duncan is also the ISO convener for the work on community resilience. James Krask, Global Head of Resilience Advisory at Marsh. James previously worked for PwC and has advised clients in a wide range of sectors with a particular focus in infrastructure, financial services, media, and government. At Marsh, James' recent focus has been to lead the firm's crisis response support services to clients impacted by COVID-19. He's also had held head roles for the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority and the BBC. His prior experience includes roles with the Cabinet Office, which include work in COBRA during the, the, the last pandemic. James is currently the convener of the ISO group working on BCM and organizational resilience. And our last panelist is Richard Look, a senior resilience consultant at Thornton Tomasetti. Richard has firsthand experience of every aspect of resilience from, 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 from preparing communities to developing hazard mitigation to the coordination of numerous emergency responses and recovery operations. He has worked at every level of government developing policy, implementing strategy, running critical operations, managing projects, and creating business cases for resilience capacity building. 
Richard was an officer in the British Army for seven years and spent eight years in charge of business continuity and emergency planning for Bath in Northeast Somerset. So we're very fortunate to have such an experienced group of panelists with such a vast amount of standardization experience. So I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Breer uh, as our first speaker, please. Kevin? Thanks, D thanks, Dave, and good afternoon. Um, if we can go to, to the overview slide, please. Thank you very much. So um, this afternoon, in my two minutes, we're going to talk about the introduction and context of crisis management um, within the Resilience Archipelago. We'll talk about the difference between an incident and a crisis because that's important, uh, uh, using the right tool for the, the challenges in front of us. We'll talk about crisis management principles and the key elements of crisis management. And in the conclusion, we'll, we'll have a quick look about some of the things that organisations can do at the moment to try and improve their, <coughs> their crisis management capabilities and try and uh, sustain their response over what looks like it's going to be quite a, a protracted period. If we can go to the next slide, please, Dave. So <coughs> the Resilience Archipelago is the group or family of standards that all come together to build uh, an organization's resilience. Um, they, uh, the analogy or metaphor of an archipelago is, is something that I came across uh, a few years ago and uh, I think is a very relevant uh, mental image because all of these um, disparate uh, disciplines, standards, such as risk management, business continuity, crisis management, information security, governance, all of the, all of the family Although they look like disparate areas, they are all in fact joined together just below the waterline. And they all come together to build that, that resilience capability in an organization. So, so I believe, and, and, and uh, I don't think I'm alone in this belief, is that risk management is the foundation that, that all of these disciplines are, are built upon. And um, the, the next level uh, in the hierarchy above that is instant management. And that's the first level of the tool set that we use when things go wrong. If one thinks about incidents, incidents are those sort of things or, or issues that happen very frequently in organisations, especially in IT environments. They, they occur daily uh, without any great impact upon the organisation. And the, the problems that they cause, the disruption that they cause, is usually managed within the day-to-day -day and business as usual activities of an organization and doesn't cover, doesn't cause too much distress and too much uh, problems, too many problems, should I say. And, and they don't rarely require strategic intervention. However, um, the situation where, where an incident creates such a, a, a large impact or a, a catastrophic level impact requires that strategic input. And we're talking about the situation where, where the objectives are no longer clear, where the route to resolution is no longer clear. And actually we're gonna to have to have a sort of a team effort to come together and bring all of the resources of the organization to bear upon the challenge to then fix it. And it needs that, that command and control and the leadership piece to actually coordinate the activities and make sure that they, they um, operate effectively. And when one thinks about all of those, those various bits that we were just talking about, that is what creates resilience in an organization. It's that end-to-end -end piece of, of, um, of work and how it all hangs together, making sure there's no overlaps, making sure the jigsaw all clips together and making sure that there's no gaps that problems fall through. So let's move on now and look at the definition of a crisis and how that differs from an incident. Next slide, please, Dave. So this is from the, the free standard that you can download, which is the, the BSNTS 17091, which is the European standard on crisis management. Um, that was developed from the, the British standard 11200. And this standard or this standard document will be the basis for the new ISO standard that's currently being worked on. But uh, as a document in its own right, it's a very, very good document and I commend it to you for your attention. As I say, it's free, um, there, there's some great stuff in there and, and it's well worth reading. However, um, onto the bit here. An incident is that adverse event 
that could call to a lead of disruption loss of emergency. Whereas a crisis is an unprecedented or an extraordinary event that threatens an organisation and requires a strategic, adaptive and timely response in order to preserve its viability and integrity. And when we're talking about this, this threat, it's an existential threat, something that really could, could cause catastrophic damage to the organisation. Crisis management principles. Um, these are the high level principles that we need to think about. And each crisis will have a phase a sequence of events. So you have the pre-crisis piece, the planning where you put all your arrangements in place if you have the opportunity. Then you actually have the, the response phase where you actually realise that something terrible has happened and you need that elevated level of response. And then you have the consolidation or stabilisation phase. Now, looking at the, the current COVID-19 crisis, we are still in that consolidation or stabilisation phase. We haven't yet actually got a grip of the the virus and the, the levels of infection that it's causing and so at the moment we're still consolidating and stabilizing our response before we can move to the recovery phase. The recovery phase is that return to normality and for us that'll be how we think about how we move out of lockdown and how we deal with the social distancing still required then the return to, return to normality and the piece that's really important is actually learning from from our mistakes and what went well and preparing for the next challenge because unfortunately this won't be the the last crisis that we have to deal with let's move on to to the next first principle which is the team response next slide please dave thank you so that team response i was talking about um it says in the center there that the crisis management team could be separate from the executive team sometimes in smaller organizations they're all one team um, it depends on the size of the organisation and the structure they put in place as to how they actually put the command and control and leadership structure in place. Um, and also, we don't talk about gold, silver, bronze here, which is very much a, a, a UK blue light type piece, but also some organisations use that structure as well to split up the various levels of, of the response process. But as you can see there, there is a very wide membership that needs to come into the team. And so all of these guys and girls have to work together and they have to collaborate. And so when we're thinking about the current crisis, we actually have to think about how we maintain that level of knowledge, support and specialist input over a protracted period, especially if some of the team are going to be unavailable because they're unwell and, and cannot support the process. And so we need to build in resilience to the crisis management team itself and think about um, alternates and deputies where we can. Next slide, please, Dave. So key elements of crisis management. This is what you do to, to try and manage a crisis in a nutshell. First of all, you need to build a shared understanding of the situation. That means you need to get your head around what's happening and how that's impacting your organisation. And you need to speak to your people in the organisation to get that information and, and bring it through. You need to define clear objectives and strategies. You then put in place the command and control structure and that requires leadership, which is not the same as management. Uh, and that's a, a very distinct process, a separate process. You need a communication structure that covers your messaging internally and externally. And we need to think about actually how, how our actions are perceived in what we do in our response and how that will look after the event. And as I've said, we've already spoken of building resilience into the crisis management team. And then on to the conclusion slide, please, Dave. We've got about a minute left to go. So, first of all, the organisation needs to understand the spectrum of capabilities that it has at its disposal. So you need to think about your business continuity solutions, your crisis management solutions. You need to use the right tool for the challenge in front of you. Um, ideally, your, your people would have been trained before this has all happened. For many of us, that opportunity has been lost, but that doesn't mean that we can't use the, the, the methodologies. So actually talking through in tabletops or walkthroughs, thinking about how potential impacts could unfold will still have value and will still be relevant uh, as the situation unfolds. And the key message in, in this current situation is that flexibility and adaptability really is the, the order of the day. But by looping back what you do to those objectives that we spoke about earlier and sense checking that the outcomes are, are as measured, then, then that will um, keep you on the right track. And then the last slide, please, Dave. 
and that's what should drop me up to 10 minutes. So that's my 10 minutes. That was a very, very quick run through and I apologize for the brevity of it. I'm now handing over to Rick Caldworth. Thank you very much, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next few moments just talking through how organizations can plan through this period that um, uh, Kevin referred to as a period of consolidation and stabilization, which I, I fully agree with. Um, I've termed it as well as response phase two towards recovery, but we're certainly not yet in a recovery phase. So I'll, I'll talk through this. Next slide, please. Dave. Just looking at the left-hand side of this slide first, um, three core planning principles, I think, that organizations should, should think about. Um, the first one is around safety. Um, it's, it's vital to maintain safety, both for your own people, but also customers. Uh, and others who, who may be interacting with your organization. So safety, first and foremost, I think is a core planning principle through the next few months. Second is flexibility. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but you know, we, we may well see a, a situation that continues to evolve and to an extent chop and change. Uh, and the flexibility uh, is gonna be important, particularly in terms of meeting changing demands and maintaining or adjusting supply. And the third planning principle is about resilience. And that's making sure the way your organization is set up and is able to operate is viable and sustainable, and makes best uses of resources uh, as we go forwards. On the right hand side then, just to talk a little bit more about that flexibility, you, many of you may well be familiar with the sort of um, pandemic curves and the potential for a second peak or indeed a third peak or more. And this just illustrates that. Uh, over the next uh, next period of time. And you'll see as well on these curves, I've got scenarios A, B, and C illustrated. A is a scenario I'm gonna to refer to as rising peak, uh, and uh, B is a scenario I'm referred to as post peak, and C is a scenario I'll refer to as towards recovery. I'll talk a little bit more about those three scenarios in a second. But the important thing here is just to recognize we could cycle between A, B, and C, back to B, or back to even to A uh, at any point uh, through, through the next three, 12, 18 months or so. Uh, so the important thing here about the flexibility is by planning against each, each of these three scenarios, you have the ability to adjust your operations uh, to, to uh, fit the conditions at the time. Next slide, please, Dave. So a bit more about these three scenarios. These are uh, meant to paint a picture. They're not meant to be prescriptive or, or anything, but they give a basis uh, which to, to see the world perhaps, or see the UK or wherever, whichever location you're in, uh, and, and then put some more detail behind it. So scenario A, as I said, is, is uh, termed as rising peak. And that, in that scenario, we're in conditions very similar to how we are in the UK. It's fairly extensive social distancing and lockdown. Uh, a, a strategy of, of suppressing the virus predominantly. Scenario B is the post-peak. Uh, this scenario is where you see some lifting uh, and gradual lifting of restrictions, but by no means lifting of all restrictions. So there's still many restrictions going to be in place in this sort of post-peak scenario. I'll come back to that one in a second. And then scenario C is what I've termed as towards recovery. Um, this does not mean we're in full recovery. The pandemic is still uh, in play, but many restrictions have now been lifted, indeed most restrictions, but case isolation, contact tracing, and testing are still key themes that are ongoing uh, and uh, will, will remain as conditions in scenario C. So those are the three scenarios. Just coming back to scenario B post-peak, um, in some ways, and, and many organizations I've spoken to they see this as potentially the most complex one for them to, to plan against. Not only because the exact nature of what that scenario is going to look like, which restrictions will be lifted and exactly when, um, it, it being sort of a variable, but also because they see that there will be choices they may have to make. Um, and they're not necessarily all going to be easy charge, uh, choices. So just as by way of an example, if the government um, lifts restrictions on people going back to workplace, or at least some people going back to workplace, I think then it's still organizations have a choice about, would we reopen a, an office or a site? Uh, if we would, uh, are we encouraging people back? Are we gonna encourage them just to continue working from home if that's possible? 
Uh, and if we do need to, open, will our supplies, will our security, will our catering services, will our cleaning services be able to, to be, be uh, uh, in place as well for that? So quite a bit of planning considerations, but also quite a few choices, I think, that organisations would have to make around that scenario. For each of these scenarios, let's say they, they paint a picture, um, the next stages are for organisations to put their own specific planning assumptions uh, beneath these scenarios. And, you know, again, my suggestion often is to lead with sort of demand type planning assumptions. Uh, so, you know, is, this, is the demand for a particular product or service going to go up or down under each of these scenarios? And then you can plan in more detail uh, what changes you would make to your operations uh, and what actions you would take, including considerations around site opening, uh, the pe people, uh, supplies, and indeed finance. So those are the sorts of things uh, to go through and work through. So we've got the scenarios, set the planning assumptions, um, and then decide on what changes you need to make, and then plan out the actions to support those changes. So those are the sort of steps behind this. Just on my last slide, Dave, next slide, please. Um, just to sort of conclude and some tips and recommendations here. Uh, the first one is to consider whether you need to make changes now to enhance the resilience in the current situation. So scenario A, the rising peak scenario, which in the UK, that is where we are, and many organizations have been operating now for several weeks under that scenario. Um, it, it's still, I think, timely just to reflect on whether those operations remain safe, uh, remain resilient, and indeed are starting to have the flexibility to meet the demand changes you've had. Um, we've seen quite a few organizations having to relax things like um, controls or having to put in place uh, fairly quickly, you know, increased security protection over some of their, their um, computer assets. So it's time to have a, a review of that and see if there are any further changes you can make to enhance, enhance resilience or flexibility. The second one here is to plan for partial lifting of restrictions now. Uh, we, we know it will come at some time, we don't know exactly when, depending on, you know, if you're other parts of Europe, you can see, you can see that starting to happen now. Um, but you need to work through what would that mean for you, what will you do, and how will you do it. The third recommendation here is uh, to consider other potential risks. Uh, there may be key risks with the way you're operating. Uh, for example, a key site failure, a key third-party failure, or a technology failure. Uh, and it's uh, unfortunate that you know, we're in a long period of this, this crisis, uh, and it is almost inevitable for some organizations, other risks will materialize uh, through this period of time as well. And now is a time for fairly active risk management. The final one here is to also plan towards recovery. And in doing so, to very closely monitor um, other countries that have released many of the restrictions, uh, particularly in Asia Pacific, and see what lessons can be learned from countries already in this phase, and in particular from similar organizations already in this phase. I think we can learn a lot potentially from, you know, uh, things like um, social behaviors and demand changes. Um, and if I reflect, for example, on China, they opened cinemas, but then closed them again fairly quickly because people were not comfortable going back to cinemas uh, in the immediate uh, lifting of restrictions. So you can learn from these sorts of things and, and plan forward. Anyway, that's, um, that's some um, thoughts from myself. I'm going to um, pass over to Malcolm Cornish now, and Malcolm will talk through the business continuity management system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Cornish, uh, and I was the project team leader for ISO 22313. Uh, one of the two standards relating to business continuity management systems that I'm going to be talking about. I'm also a UCAS technical assessor for ISO 22301. Now, both are management system standards adopting the high level structure, identical core text, common terms and core de definitions from the ISO directives part one that I'm sure you are all familiar with. Uh, ISO 22301 sets out the requirements with ISO 22313 setting, providing the guidance. And both are uh, available as free downloads from the BSI website. And I see a link has been put in um, so you can find that pretty easily. 
Uh, comparing the management system components of the two standards uh, with other such standards reveals clear differences. But the questions are, firstly, are those differences significant? Uh, and secondly, what do they tell you about business continuity management? Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are, uh, I first became involved in business continuity management in the 1980s, having trained as a chartered accountant and then specializing in computer, computer audit. Uh, I'm not sure I ever looked as uh, young as Isabella uh, did in her excellent keynote speech, but anyway, um, I'm also interested to think what she might look like in 2070. Uh, uh, that will be interesting. Um, at that time when I started, the major push was to encourage organizations to use the term business continuity management instead of business continuity planning, which mistakenly implies an emphasis on written plans. Business continuity is a capability uh, and business continuity management is the process of developing and maintaining that capability. Fast forwarding to the noughties, uh, my fellow business continuity professionals and I, uh, who developed the or worked on the BS 25999 that um, Dave mentioned, uh, both parts one and two, we were delighted to be invited to join an ISO committee when, where we were introduced to management systems as a vehicle that would encourage organizations not only to treat the subject as a management discipline, but also to embrace it within a structured framework that would enable it to be implemented and maintained properly and furthermore continually improved. The high level structure and cortex that I referred to uh, when we developed the 2012 version was still evolving, um, but we did develop a fully fledged management system standard labeled societal security business continuity management system requirements. Since then, the committee name changed, the high level structure and core text has continued to evolve. Uh, and we also received fairly clear feedback that there was confusion between the management system elements and the discipline of business continuity management. Now, all of these factors resulted in the decision following its systematic review that ISO 22301 should be revised. Hence the publication last October of ISO 22301 2019, security and resilience now, business continuity management system requirements. That was followed as quickly as we could manage by ISO 22313, which was uh, published in February of this year. Uh, and just looking at the, great, the uh, progression, you will see that I've aged considerably since the early days. Uh, to prepare for today's presentation, I tracked down the 2019th, which is the 10th edition of the ISO IEC Directives Part 1, Annex L9, I think it used to be called something different, uh, Appendix 2. Now, comparing ISO 22301, the latest version, with a standard text, reveals a number of noticeable differences that have undoubtedly come about as a result of input from technical experts in the discipline of business continuity. Next slide, please. There are editorial changes. Uh, primarily, those are just to introduce subclauses where a clause covers more than one distinctive requirement. To be fair, I think that actually it was the ISO editor, Nicola Peru, who put those in, so we can't claim that credit. But undoubtedly, many of the changes are influenced by the technical expertise and subject matter. Uh, of the project team members. Uh, on, in the relation to context, there's a note referring to risk and there are throughout the standard further references to risk in clauses relating to planning and risk assessment. And Kev mentioned that issue about you know, the, risk, uh, the risk element of the work that we do. Now, business continuity specialists are particularly sensitive uh, when it comes to risk analysis techniques. Rather than look back at past events or look at the current event, even with uh, the current pandemic, uh, and use analysis and guesswork based on what has happened in the past to prepare for the future and what might or might not happen, 
we prefer to look at what would happen if normal activities were to stop and how quickly impacts that matter to the organization would arise. We then try to be imaginative and come up with a wide range of solutions that would prevent, mitigate, or even avoid those impacts. Where we use risk, risk techniques and experience of past events is to get a handle on whether or not ideas are likely to work. Uh, when we look at context in the, the standard, there's almost also more emphasis on legal and regulatory requirements um, in the section on needs and expectations of interested parties. It will be interesting to see if there's a move to introduce new regulations or legislation with regard to business continuity as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we also introduced a brand new clause, which uh, I'm not sure how it came in, but it's planning changes to the BCMS and that, or the business continuity management system. That's a whole new sub clause, which really points to the need for effective change management. Uh, in awareness, awareness is a particular business continuity issue. It talks about those working under the control of the organization, i.e. everybody that uh, works for an organization, being aware of their role and responsibilities before, during, and after disruption. So preparation on that side is, is very important. Uh, communication is another thing that is particularly focused on in our discipline. Uh, in the standard text, it talks about what, when, with whom, and how. Uh, we have added, and, and who will do the communication as well as a requirement. Um, scope is a particular issue for business continuity, and there are specific requirements around exclusions. Um, for business continuity, it's particularly important to ensure that everything that contributes to the performance of activities that are within scope are also included. For example, it would clearly not be acceptable to, to exclude critical activities. Next slide, please, Dave. Uh, if we look at the uh, check and improve uh, sections, we're a bit, perhaps a little bit more prescriptive in terms of the need to act and follow up, which is not in the standard text. Uh, we like from the management review side inputs to get feedback uh, on the need for change and uh, specific to BCM, we talk about near misses. Uh, we had a discussion in the committee about whether they should actually be called near hits um, and that went into a draft but ended up as near misses. Uh, in terms of the output, we are asking that specifically management provides decisions on scope variations and updates uh, uh, and issues and measuring effectiveness. Uh, and also action on the part of management to communicate to interested parties and take appropriate action. Uh, in terms of improvement, it's requirement to determine opportunities and implement actions. Uh, and also using the output from the audit and management review to identify needs and opportunities. So that's just a, a quick flavor, but as project leader for developing and revising ISO 22313, I clearly have to give it special mention. Next slide, please, Dave. One of the things that happened along the way when ISO 22301 2019 was being worked on took place in Sydney. I was on my way to the committee meeting via Melbourne in February 2018, where unfortunately I fell ill, uh, diagnosed with severe atypical pneumonia with LFT. Yes, I had to look that up, liver function test derangement. And I spent four or five days in hospital with oxygen support. Now, I only mention that because the symptoms were uncannily similar to those of COVID-19. So the current crisis brings back memories of two years ago. During the Sydney meeting that unsurprisingly I did not attend, the decision was taken to remove the term business continuity management from ISO 22301 2019. Uh, I can understand why business continuity management management system is clearly uh, a bit too much of a mouthful, uh, but I was determined that the term which is used and understood extensively throughout the world should not be lost. 
with the support of my excellent project team, we were able to reintroduce it as the only definition in ISO 2231-2020. And the standard also explains that if you want to know what business continuity management is, just turn to clause four. Next slide. So hopefully I've explained some of the changes that have been incorporated into the BCM standard and that they may have relevance and be adopted by other management systems. Hopefully also you will have a better appreciation of what business continuity management is. Uh, and now I'll hand over to Duncan Shaw, who will talk about volunteering. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about uh, volunteers and about how volunteers can support vulnerable people. This is quite a different topic to one that we've been talking about already this afternoon and different to what we'll talk about a bit later. But some of your employees might be going to support the COVID effort. Some of your employees may be vulnerable people who are currently staying at home in the shielded communities and making sure that they are kept safe from the virus. So one of the um, standards that has been made freely available is 22395 and that is guidelines on supporting vulnerable people in an emergency and also 22319 on supporting or planning the involvement of spontaneous volunteers. And so this, this afternoon I'll talk very briefly about what those contain and just try to give you an insight as to um, those documents and, uh, and how they might be applicable to your organisations. Next slide please. So, starting with volunteers, um, the volunteers who are coming to support at the moment, uh, they want to do good, they want to help. They are watching what's happening on the television, they're watching what's happening to members of their um, family, to people in the streets, and they want to take back control of their lives. They realise that they um, are locked into their houses at the moment. We are in, currently in lockdown and they want to, to try and take back some of that control. However, there is a growing anxiety about the situation. So whilst we've got lots of volunteers out on the streets helping vulnerable people, they're going to supermarkets and so forth, they are beginning to see some anxieties um, of standing in supermarket queues, being beside people who are affected, feeling that the virus is coming closer and closer to them. And um, what we um, are also seeing is that volunteers want to volunteer when it's convenient to them and that they want to be activated now. They want to go and do their um, tasking and they want to do it very, very quickly on tasks that they want to do. And all of these issues are contained within 22319 in terms of understanding who these um, volunteers are, but also who are the vulnerable people. And um, we understand that in the context currently, these are people who have particular health conditions, who have been advised by the government to stay at home, to shield themselves in their house and to make sure that they are protected. Next slide, please. So um, we have been... Um, we can look within 22319 and see that it contains a series of guidelines for managers of volunteers. It, talks about that we have a duty of care to the volunteers to make sure that they have a task and that that task is one that is clearly defined, that we have insurance in place for the volunteers, that we have a briefing and tasking of the volunteers and that that is going um, effectively and that we make sure that the volunteers are debriefed, that they are checked on to make sure that they themselves are um, are, are happy are, are good in terms of welfare and um, the standard outlines how these things are important to make sure that your volunteer base is um, is taken care of and um, and, and addressed um, the standard also talks about the processes that we need to have in place. It talks about how we can look to what the risks are of involving volunteers, how we can reduce those risks, how we can perhaps not put um, volunteers who we don't know in direct contact with vulnerable people, um, but instead understand who these volunteers are by registering them, by assessing them and their suitability for tasks, and then matching them with the demands of the task that they um, may wish to take on. In some cases, volunteers won't be a won't be suitable, um, either at the life of the crisis or the life of the incident, 
or because that particular volunteer um, may have some, um, some characteristics which mean that they maybe are not suitable for volunteering at that time. For example, in the current conditions, if they're showing signs of, um, of having virus. Um, but some other processes that we need to think about is in part of the risk assessment is whether PPE is needed, whether they have to have ID and the sort of ID and how that, that can be used. Next slide, please. Also in 22319, it talks about the importance of management structures. It talks about um, having uh, supervisors available for volunteers so that they can get help if they need it. And making sure that there's relationships between external organisations, spontaneous volunteers, and the very, very local group um, who may be volunteering through Facebook, through just neighbourhood um, initiatives, and making sure that all of these initiatives are working together to support the vulnerable people, that these um, are not falling over each other um, or, or pro providing an inconsistent um, support. In 22319, it talks very much about the proportionate and scalable volunteer effort. So whilst in the UK at the moment, local authorities are um, experiencing an overwhelming, uh, pleasantly an overwhelming number of volunteers, um, and they have um, processes scaled up to accept that number. So if that number was 100, then what would happen if that quadrupled and all of a sudden you have 800 volunteers presenting? One of the challenges that the UK had when it asked for 250,000 spontaneous volunteers and it got 750,000 applicants. And so those applicants are still being processed because the, the, it was just an un, unexpected uh, response. But some parts of the system will struggle and which parts will struggle first. So in some cases, it may be the registration process. It may be the supervision process. It may be the tasking process. But if you understand where the pinch points are of the system, then you can try and make sure that that is scalable, but also making sure that it's proportionate to the size of the incident and the number or the amount of demand that you think you might have. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the other things that we're thinking about um, in, from 22319 is a code of conduct for volunteers, realising that when volunteers go out of their organisation and go and volunteer, then many will have volunteered before, but some may not have. And so making sure that the volunteers are um, very aware of what they should do and how they should interact with the beneficiaries of their, of their service. So in the UK at the moment, we've got a lot of shielded people and those people are being supported in some cases by volunteers. And so, so the volunteers know how they should be interacting with those vulnerable people. So, for example, they should um, leave the parcel of food um, at, their, at the front door of the, the, of the vulnerable person. They should knock on the door, they should take two steps back and they should wait for the vulnerable person to come and collect that parcel. If the parcel is not able to be collected by the person, for example, they can't bend down that far in order to collect the parcel, then the, vul per the volunteer should not take the parcel inside their house. That is breaking the, um, the shielding arrangements. And so other things need to be done in order to support that vulnerable person. But again, this code of conduct can help the volunteers to know what they're allowed to do and what is not expected of them. Next slide, please. So um, one of the very important things is thinking about how do you sustain the volunteer effort. So at the moment we have an uh, unpleasant situation of having an overwhelming number of volunteers, but um, when volunteers start returning back to work, when the, lo when the lockdown gets lifted, then we might see a drop off in volunteers. We'll see a drop off due to sickness, we'll see a drop off due to perhaps um, uh, fear creating or a, a frustration um, emerging from people not being deployed. And so we need to think about how do we sustain this volunteering effort? And within the standard, there are some thoughts on that um, that can help those organisations. Part of that is through communication. Part of it is it through sharing good stories, through sharing um, very clear messages of how volunteers are helping in this effort. But also we need to assess what volunteers are doing so that these stories are obvious and they can be shared. Next slide, please. 
So um, we have a large number of volunteers at the moment and there are a whole range of alternative tasks beyond what the NHS response has asked for. And so just on the slide at the moment are some quite wide range of tasks that um, local authorities, that NGOs can consider getting volunteers involved in because the demand on volunteers is lower than expected the supply of volunteers is higher than expected and so we can expand the type of tasks that volunteers can get involved in. Next slide please. So um, thank you very much for listening and um, as I say many of your people in your organisation will be volunteering and these two standards are there to identify how they can be done so um, in a safe and uh, supportive way. I'd like to hand over to James Krask, who's going to talk about some of the work he's been doing in TC292. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan. So, uh, yes, my name's James Krask. Um, I work for Marsh, but I also um, chair the working group that looks after the business continuity and resilience standards at ISO. What I wanted to, to, to do in the short time I have is to talk a little bit about some of the emerging lessons that are arising from our experience so far <clears throat> with COVID um, and what that might mean for us in the medium to long term as, uh, as organisations and also for resilience professionals alike. Um, if we just move to the next slide, please, uh, please Dave. This, this slide is um, a version of a, um, or, or a summary of some research that um, Marsh delivered last year with Cranfield University. Uh, and what it is showing is the impact of large organisational crises on share performance of various different organisations that have suffered a crisis. Um, it's actually research that, that um, many of you may have seen before in an earlier form. Um, and that's because uh, the research was originally conducted in the 1990s um, but we wanted to update it with a series of more up-to-date um, case studies. So people like Facebook are in there from their experience for, with Cambridge Analytica, Volkswagen with the, uh, the emissions issues, um, and Nissan for their experience of, uh, uh, of responding to the Japanese earthquake and, and tsunami. And what this shows is that organisations that handle their crisis well, and by that I mean are demonstrating good crisis management behaviours post-crisis are actually rewarded in the longer term with an enhanced share performance relative to peers of around about 5%. And those organisations that lose value um, tend to be characterised um, by opposite behaviours. So some of the organisations in that bottom group um, perhaps were a bit slow to respond um, perhaps didn't communicate as openly and transparently as they should have done and therefore lost share performance and had real difficulty recovering it in the, uh, in, in the long term. Some, some never have. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this in the middle of a crisis because the things that you do right now as organisations have a very real impact on your ability to recover and how good that recovery will be. So it sounds a bit perverse to start talking about a recovery when we're still in the middle of a lockdown with our employees perhaps working remotely or our production facilities operating in a slightly different way to, to, to normal. But going back to something that Rick mentioned earlier, actually spending some time now thinking about how to recover is going to be really important. And one of the things that I think we need to be doing um, as we go through this crisis, is exploring some of the lessons that are arising uh, from, uh, from our experiences and the challenges that we've been facing um, to make sure that we learn from those um, in, the, uh, in the future. So we go to the next slide, please, uh, Dave. So this is, this is a summary of, of um, mostly my own personal experiences of working with clients since January um, in responding to, uh, to, to COVID. Um, now, in the early days, when I say early days, it was only January. It sort of feels like a long time ago now, but a lot has happened in that, in that short space of time. But in January, the focus, particularly in Europe and the UK, was around supply chains. Because remember, uh, we were asking questions of ourselves about 
what an extended lockdown um, would do for um, we in China um, through our supply chains and our organizations. It wasn't until um, it, the infection started to spread across Europe and into the UK, Italy being the, uh, uh, the, the, the first major milestone, um, that organizations started to, to, to think about the more systemic impacts upon their, their business. So there are four things that have come out from my experience so far. One, I think we, we've, we've realized um, that our supply chains, one, we don't know enough about them. Um, and two, they're much more fragile than perhaps they ought to be. On that we don't know enough about them, I think what we've experienced, or many organizations have experienced, is that whilst we understand our tier one suppliers, these really critical suppliers that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, actually the issue for many organizations have been deeper in the supply chain. It's the suppliers, suppliers that have had problems and had the same level of disruptive effect on the organization. So I think there's a big lesson around knowing our supply chains um, better um, and making sure that they're, uh, they're much more resilient. Second lesson relates to, um, to how the various different governments across the world have reacted and responded to, uh, to this situation. Um, and this causes huge confusion for business, particularly global business that are operating across uh, jurisdictions. Every country is taking a slightly different approach. Every country is using slightly different scientific models to underpin their decision making. And every country is making different decisions. And it makes it really hard to forecast um, what the impacts might be in the medium to long term and what, what you might need to do about it as an organization. And the third lesson relates quite, uh, quite closely to, um, to that. And that is the point about information. There's just too much of it for this crisis. Um, we turn on the news and there is another commentator talking about um, their view of what might happen. There's another model, an academic model that has been released that demonstrates a slightly different outcome to the one that we talked about yesterday. It's really hard for business decision makers to, um, to make decisions in an environment where the policy situation is changing on a day, almost daily basis and the data underpinning that policy decision making is, uh, is, is highly fragmented. And then finally, and I think probably um, the, the starkest lesson of, an all, of all, particularly for someone like me that, that makes a living out of writing um, crisis and business continuity plans, for many organizations, they, they, they experienced in the early days of the crisis um, that their plans were just not fit for purpose. Um, and the reasons for that, um, I think, go back to some, some of the points that, uh, uh, that Malcolm made earlier. A lot of those plans just didn't, didn't have a wide enough scope to cover the kind of uh, global impacts that we're, we're suffering from today or hadn't considered scenarios where um, you needed to recover your business to almost a, a complete you know, change from uh, working in an office to a remote working environment. Um, I worked with a lot of banking institutions that had made big assumptions in their plans about moving trading floors from location A to location B when their main location was unavailable. But of course, that scenario just doesn't work. In, a, in, in, in the COVID experience because you want to be physically separating people rather than putting them in, in another place where they'll be equally at risk. So that point about scope um, and focus of business continuity is important. So what does this all mean for, 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 for resilience? Well, I think it means that um, our response um, at times has been a bit inflexible. Um, it's been slow at times because we've been on the back foot to issues rather than being proactive and thinking about what the future might look like. We've been forced to make decisions based on very um, little data or sometimes too much data that conflicts. Um, it's now difficult for organisations to some of Rick's um, points earlier on about knowing when to start bringing resources back on stream, particularly when there's so much uncertainty over um, how different governments are going to uh, uh, start to bring, uh, bring release uh, lockdowns. Um, and it's, it's, it's really hard to maximise resilience across your, um, your, your value chain if you don't understand, for example, some of the supply chain 
um, uh, consequences I mentioned earlier. So if we go to the next slide, please, Dave. Thank you. So thinking about the future, what might this mean for resilience? Um, now, I'm linking all of this to, uh, to ISO 22316, which is um, an international standard that looks at organizational resilience. And it describes the principles and the attributes of what makes an organization more resilient. And I think a lot of what we're experiencing today with COVID um, talks um, and aligns quite nicely to the contents within 22316, which uh, is one of the standards that's being made freely available today. So number one, I mentioned earlier on the previous slide, I think we'll see an expanded focus um, for, for our planning. One, gone will be the days where plans in their out of scope section talk about assuming that the crisis will not impact upon all of their locations at any one go across the, uh, across the globe. And believe me, I've, written, I've, I've read a few of those plans in the last two weeks, so clearly they, they just didn't stand up to, uh, to muster in this crisis. Two, I think we'll see more rigorous testing. Um, testing to make sure that the plans capture and address all of the most credible um, and realistic worst case scenarios that the organization may, uh, may suffer from. I think we'll see improved integration between risk management and business continuity in particular, um, particularly when we're using scenarios to help stress test our business continuity arrangements. And I also think we're going to see better use of data to underpin decision-making um, around the crisis management team table. So what, what will I expect to be doing um, when, I, uh, uh, when, I, when I start working with clients in, in, in addressing some of these lessons? One, planning for more global events and challenge those planning assumptions that are currently written into to plans to make sure that they're actually um, uh, sensible. I think I'll be using more scenarios to stress test, um, linked to operational and strategic risks to test plans. Um, there'll be much greater alignment between different risk dis disciplines and also an organization's strategy and operations processes. Um, and I'll expect um, organizations to be making better data-driven operational decisions underpinned by the financial outcomes that matter. By that, I mean actually some modeling around how um, a crisis event may impact upon the organization in the, uh, in the medium to long term. So, when we finish today, and once we've done the, uh, uh, the Q&A session uh, to wrap this, uh, uh, wrap this uh, session up, I would, I would encourage you to download a copy of 22316 to have a look at whether some of the guidance in there can help you navigate through, uh, uh, through the recovery. On that point, what I'm going to do now is hand over to uh, Richard Look, um, who is going to talk to us um, in a bit more detail on resilience in the context of cities. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, James. Um, so we've got 10 minutes, so obviously that's not a huge barrier about time. So um, BS 67000, which is the City Resilience Standard, is a standard focused on sp um, specifically progressing resilience within cities. And as it's a new standard, I'm going to focus on just introducing it and then making some um, comparisons with COVID-19. So if you'd like to move on, please, Dave. So why cities? Um, here we have a map of the world and you can see the, the various bubbles representing the size of the cities. The inner circle is present day or 2015. The outer circle is where that will be by 2045. So you can see um, that there's a lot of population growth and where that population growth is going to be. Um, and you can see that a lot of these major new developing cities are actually in areas of high, ha high hazard. If you could just click on please one, Dave. So at the moment, 1% of the world's service is covered by cities and 54% of the world's population is in cities. However, by 2050, that will be 70% of the world's population. So you can see an increasing and um, increasingly cities being the predominant way people will be living. If you can click on again, please, Dave. Um, and so we're going through a period of accelerating urbanization. And this is having an impact on our, um, our planet, as we can all understand. So 75% of the world's energy is consumed in cities. 80% of the world's greenhouse gases is produced by cities. And there is a, a, still a great deal of city development 
to take place in the next 30 years. If you click on please, Dave. So let's talk about the City Resilience Guide itself. So the guide itself provides a number of sections. It provides fundamentals, um, it provides a framework for developing city resilience, it provides case studies throughout, and it also provides a comprehensive matrix providing specific guidance of ev for every stage. If you could please click on, please, Dave. Um, so the City Resilience Guide uses the ISO definition of resilience, which is the ability to absorb and adapt in the changing environment. Okay, so we're entering what's called a VUCA future, a term I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But just in case, this term means an increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous future. In a VUCA future, we need to continually improve to adapt our, and absorb um, to meet the future, what the future throws at us. Please click on Dave. To do this, the, uh, the 60, BS 67000 committee boiled city resilience down to five fundamentals being integrated, inclusive, adaptive, reflective, and durable. Please click on. The first fundamental being integrated, our cities are made up of complex systems of systems. And increasingly over time, these, this complexity is growing. As cities grow and technology and society demands greater have abilities to greater demands on our infrastructure, therefore it becomes more complex. The better a city can integrate its systems, the better it can function, and the greater number of benefits it will be delivered for its citizens in terms of improved quality of life and improved economic prosperity. The example we have here, if you look at the picture, is of Glasgow. Um, many of you probably have already identified that. This illustrates the benefit of being integrated. Glasgow um, adopted a public health approach to knife crime. Taking this integrated approach, working with its partners from across society, reduced knife crime homicides from 40 children and teenagers in 2006 to eight in 2016. We are seeing this with COVID-19, where many services and institutions are coordinating far closer than normal to ensure our society can function, even through this difficult time. Please kick on, Dave. So the next fundamental is um, inclusive. Uh, this is important for two, two respects. So firstly, inclusivity and cohesive communities are better for community mental health and reduce internal stresses that can result in civil unrest and other shocks and stresses. Secondly, this, this is shuck, shuck up, or oh, you've clicked on one bit too far. Dave, can you go back one? Thank you. This is uh, an example of Chicago. Um, and this example shows how two very similar neighborhoods within Chicago could have very different outcomes resulting from a heat wave. And the only dis discernible differentiator um, of that was the level of community cohesiveness, measurable community cohesiveness within, that, within those communities. And the, more commu um, the higher the community cohesiveness, the better the response to that shock. We can see this with COVID-19 as well, where communities are coming together and looking after those with the greatest need. Please click on Dave. The third fundamental is to be adaptive. Uh, this is absolutely critical within the VUCA future I've been talking about. Cities which can adapt to future changes best will be the ones who are most successful. The example here is um, Singapore, as many of you will, will be able to, uh, to identify. In Singapore, um, adaptive planning regimes have been applied within the people-centric framework, so land use can be adapted quickly to meet the needs of the city. We have also seen adaptability within COVID-19, but in the, in the converse, with countries that have um, delayed their response are now having the greatest impact. Please move on, Dave. In terms of being reflective, all cities have a level of um, resilience already. And what we've got to do is take the knowledge base from within those cities and build on it and not throw the good, the good learning away. We want cities to learn and prosper. The example here is the Thames Estuary or TE2100 plan, where the Environment Agency with partners have developed an adaptive plan going out to 2100. It's well worth a look if you get a chance. Um, based on, and it's all based on um, very sound research and, and good evidence. And we see great learning also going into this COVID-19 response um, with science and evidence driving the national responses. Please click on Dave. 
And finally, we, we look at being, um, being durable. And it's worth noting that the links between, between enduring and being sustainable, and, and there's a lot of overlap. So this last example here is uh, the big U project in New York, follow, which is following Sandy, um, which will look at flood protection, which is a flood protection project in um, a U shape around the lower part of Manhattan. It's a protective measure which does, go, which does far more than just provide flood protection. It provides lots of amenities and co-benefits for New Yorkers. We can also see how layers of protection have been key to the approach to control COVID-19 with PPE, hand washing, social distancing all playing their part. Please click on Dave. So the next part of the City Resilience Standard is the framework or the roadmap. We have lots of, we have lots of input from many different organisations on this, including the United Nations Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction, World Bank, Cabinet, um, Cabinet Office, the Rockefeller Foundation and many others. And you'll see this type of management system prevalent amongst many of the standards we've already seen today. The process here starts with organise and define, which is very similar to the first step of the UN uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Strategy uh, which is of the 10 Essentials, which is um, organised for resilience. This is perhaps a key piece of learning for, COVID for the COVID-19 response. It is clear that most cities or authorities are not actively organised for resilience. The many layers of players in cities all have robust internal processes, many of which supported by the standards we've already seen today, um, but they're not coordinated um, between communities, businesses and institutions. Um, so now I'm just going to focus on how, how we can actually understand a city. And then this comes through from the second phase. So if you please click on Dave, this should pop up a bit at a time. Good. So first of all, we look at cities in terms of what they value. We understand the stakeholder groups within the city. We engage the stakeholder groups and understand what makes those cities tick and what the people want from their city. Things like quality of life, economic prosperity, mobility, reduced dep um, deprivation. If you click on Dave. But supporting those value chains within a city, you have many systems of systems, which are all listed here. And, and actually these are common across cities. So, so the proportion and the balance might be different, but all cities will have these functions. Um, if you please, please click on Dave. But all of these functions are vulnerable to or exposed to and susceptible to, and again, to various shocks and stresses um, and we've listed a, a number here so the combination of shock factors like uh, like we have here including COVID-19 um, but also sh stress factors like climate change etc all put um, pressure on, on their system systems that they they increase the potential of it failing or being disrupted so to balance that resilience demand as we call it we have resilience capacity which is that capacity to, to endure and adapt oh, Back again, Dave, please. Um, and and so we and we've divided it down that way. Um, understanding a city in this way through these value chains allows us to prioritise everything in a city. This allows us to understand what is um, the most important to the city, where the city is threatened, where it is vulnerable, what it has to reduce done to reduce that vulnerability, where there are opportunities, and where there is best to take action. A good example of this would be using the multiple indices of deprivation to target resources to, to facilitate communities through COVID-19. Thank you very much. I now hand over back to James, I believe. You do. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thanks to all of our um, speakers um, this afternoon, a real wealth of, um, of experience that you've, you've heard from. Um, we, we're getting some questions coming through on the, uh, the portal. I'd encourage everybody who's attending, if you've got a question, to, uh, to write it into the, uh, the Q&A tool on the, uh, on the system, and we'll answer as many of those as we can. Um, I haven't spoken to Dave Adamson about this, but any that we don't answer today, um, we will make sure our answered offline and we can um, we can respond back to you later so what I'm going to do I'll start with um, with with Kevin Breer if I I may um, Kevin from the list of questions that have come through are there any that you would be keen to uh, to, to cover off to start with um, yes some interesting ones um, 
that's the easiest one for CPD. As I know for the, um, the BCI, um, this would count for, for CPD for, for your continuing uh, development there with the BCI. I'm not so sure about um, other groups though. Um, but, but yeah, I think it would count for CPD for, for the BCI, but that was the cowards one. That was the easiest one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, if I turn to you, Rick, if I may, there's a, a really interesting question online about whether, um, in light of the government's PPE, uh, issues with the NHS, whether we might foresee any potential legal or regulatory changes that require public and private sectors to implement business continuity management for their supply chains. Perhaps if I ask you first, and then um, Malcolm, if you have a point of view on that one as well, we can, uh, we can ask you too. Yeah, hi James. Um, it's a difficult one. I, I won't comment directly on the PPE situation, but um, you know, I think if we've seen previous crises, and particularly if you think about the financial crisis, we absolutely did see the financial regulators there adjust and change regulations in the light of that crisis. So I guess we could anticipate some regulatory or legal changes. I think it's a bit early days to understand exactly what those might be and what they might mean. Mm. I think one thing, though, is for sure, uh, we will see organisations look very hard again at what they mean by resilience for their organization and particularly for their supply chain. Uh, I do think organizations will think hard about whether the supply chains they currently have are genuinely resilient and under what conditions that are they resilient. So David, you talked about stress testing against scenarios. I, I, I see organizations want to um, stress test their supply chain operations against certain scenarios. For sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. And it's probably worth um, reminding um, everybody that there, there is already a piece of legislation that the UK government have in place um, that requires certain organisations to have business continuity plans in place, but they tend to be those organisations that are um, first responders like the NHS, um, like the blue light services, local authorities and, and, and so on. Um, I would agree with you, you Rick. I think we are likely to see, um, uh, see, see some form of change. I think we'll definitely see organisations trying to push risk further down into their supply chain. Um, uh, you know, so I can see big organisations doing more due diligence over the quality of resilience and business continuity arrangements maintained by, uh, by their key suppliers. Malcolm, do you have anything further to add to that question? Uh, yes, yeah. I, my thoughts are that very much legislation and regulation has really helped business continuity and management to move forward over the last 15 or 20 years. And it's always been a frustration uh, of, of the people who specialize in it and understand what's involved and how to go about it to get uh, management to recognize it. And the really truly, the only truly effective mechanism has been legislation and regulation and, and, and really forcing it. Um, so I would imagine that certainly looking at, uh, and uh, it was ex interesting to raise the NHS because that's just top of our mind, but uh, you know, like Rick, I don't have any comments on that. Um, but just uh, learning something from that and deciding how best to change the re legal and regulatory framework to encourage the right sort of behaviour, to me, is a logical thing to do. Thank you, Malcolm. I think we'll also start to see more pressure coming from insurance companies as well, who will be who are always keen to see good business continuity arrangements in their uh, in the companies that they're underwriting. Um, but they'll be asking uh, more challenging questions over all of our resilience, I think, collectively. Um, Richard, a question for, for you, if I may. Um, are there any UK cities um, that um, you can reference as examples of using the city resilience standard? Do you want me to cover off that um, FOCA one as well? Yeah, please do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's VUCA, um, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Not, not FOCA. So, so sorry about that if, if I didn't make that clear. That's uh, from West Point, if you, if you, uh, that's where that was, came from. And uh, in terms of cities using city resilience, so the, the standard itself was developed, the, um, 
using experts from throughout the country. And um, there's a lot of people from lots of different disciplines in, um, adding into that. But there's a number of agendas running simultaneously. So primarily you've got the UN, which has the UN uh, strategy for disaster risk reduction. Um, and they have 10 essentials for city resilience. And then you have the Rockefeller Foundation, which uh, produced the 100 Resilient Cities. So they gave a uh, million dollars to 100 um, cities who nominated. And we had a number of cities in the UK who took part of that. So both of those uh, organizations uh, inputted into this um, in terms of standards and in terms of direct um, liaison. And so the actual standard itself, I know, is currently being used in um, Newcastle. Um, and the principles behind it are being used in all of the Rockefeller 100 resilient cities as well. Um, this is also being presented to something called the core cities, which is the top 10 cities in, um, in the UK outside of London, uh, all members of the core cities. Um, and the chief resilience officer, he, their deputy uh, was on the committee for London. So yeah, lots and lots of input from those cities. James, can I just pitch in there? And uh, Richard, the UNI, uh, UNISDR and UN Habitat. I mean, currently at ISO, uh, that standard on city resilience, BS 67,000, it was uh, so well received that in ISO, it's been adopted. It's so at least the beginning of the, that. So uh, the, the UN Habitat are based, uh, that particular branch is in, in Madrid. Uh, Duncan, you could probably pitch in there too, but uh, aren't Aren't they um, doing their best to ensure that in globally through the UN uh, network that the city resilience is actually being uh, adopted so on a very large scale? So yeah, you're right. Uh, we've taken 67,000 into ISO TC292 and in working group five we are using it to inform the development of the international standard and urban resilience. So that's a partnership between a number of organizations, UN Habitat, BSI, and um, other partners from around the world. So the idea there is to take the excellent examples of work from BS 67,000 and embed them in that standard so that they are seen um, across the world as being as being really good leading practice and um, but internationalizing them and taking them out of the UTK context and putting them into that wider uh, that wider forum. Thank you Duncan. While, while you're on the line there's another question here about um, how standards on community resilience uh, are being used in the UK's response to COVID-19. Yeah, well, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with local resilience forums, taking examples from the, the two standards I mentioned and feeding them into the response. So certainly in the very early days of the response, maybe, well, not early days, but maybe three or four weeks ago, we were looking at how volunteers could be supported in the ways that I mentioned in the presentation. So looking at how volunteer managers could be supported, as well as how the volunteers themselves could be supported. So we took um, the lessons from the standards that I mentioned and wrote them into a two page guide for volunteer managers. And that's been widely used across the UK and then developing them also into a code of conduct that I showed part of that. Um, and again, that's been widely used. Um, one of the other things that we're doing um, is going across um, the world conducting a whole series of interviews on how um, organizations and how um, experts are responding to COVID in particular in recovery. So whilst it is in the early days of recovery, lots of parts of the UK are really advancing their thinking on what recovery means. And so they're setting up recovery coordination groups and we've been commissioned to conduct a series of activities around that. So working with 100 million cities now GRCN working through UN Habitat to share these lessons so we've been developing a weekly briefing document and um, just trying to get those lessons out there from across the world so um, very happy to share that document it's freely available and um, you can contact me or get it through the university. Thank you uh, thank you for that Duncan. Uh, there's another question online here um, Rick and Malcolm I'd be interested in your views on this but I'll um, I'll read it and, and, and give my own perspectives first to give you a chance to uh, to think. Um, so it's how will the food industry need to adapt to future future-proof uh, future disruption to global food supplies 
especially to third world countries? Um, I think, I mean, that's a, a million dollar question, a really difficult one to answer in a, in, in a short term webinar. Um, I would I would go back to some of the uh, discussions that uh, the references I was making to supply chain. Um, I work with a very large um, global um, food manufacturer um, and through this experience they have um, they've identified some major vulnerabilities in their supply chains uh, in raw materials across across the globe uh, and they think that's going to be the focus for their business over the next six uh, six to twelve months um, bizarrely they're actually probably more profitable um, in uh, in this current um, crisis because um, people more people are buying their products um, so for, for them the the level of investment needed to um, to, to improve their resilience in response to these kind of events is is, um, is is not really an issue for them at this stage which it which it will be for other businesses but I think it's going to all be in the supply chain Rick do you have a point of view on that um, on that issue I think um, no, you, you you hit all the right points. I think again, you know, when people look at supply chain, I think just going back to the core principles of resilience is going to be one of the things that people perhaps want to look at. You know, is there diversity? Is there capacity? Is there redundancy? So those sorts of principles, I think people should think about. In terms of food supply, though, generally in the UK, to be fair, I think food retailers are, are, are pretty well set up generally. I mean, clearly they struggled when they had a, a very rapid and sudden increase in demand, but that was more of a logistical issue than necessarily a supply issue. Um, and I think, you know, they, what we also have to remember that these days in the UK, we have a very wide choice and range of food uh, out there. What retailers are well geared up to do is to focus on a core supply, a core core set of food products as well in, in very stressed conditions. Um, but again, you know, I'm, I'm sure people will revisit both supply chain and also, you know, how do they make sure they can deliver core supply of food at capacity when it's needed? I think it will undoubtedly be considered again. Thank you. Malcolm, anything further from you? No, <laughs> on mute, shaking his head. In which case, Richard, I wonder whether you've Sorry. got a perspective on from from a city's point of view. Um, I was, I was just uh, thinking about that myself. The um, the way we look at a city is obviously through value chains, complex systems of systems, and uh, looking at the food value chain, and obviously not just today, but out to the future. So, looking at um, it from a value chain point of view, rather than just a supply chain point of view, because Obviously, people don't want to be producing food for which there's no going to be no demand next year. So they need to be looking at the demand side as well. And then looking out to the future, although we're obviously very co focused on COVID-19, um, we know that um, climate change is having an impact and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that's accelerating. So actually, that is going to have a much greater dis uh, disruptive impact over time on our food supply chains uh, um, or value chains. So... So from a city's point of view, I would obviously want to map the systems of systems, understand the vulnerabilities and susceptibilities and actually risk manage all of that. Um, but also you need to have that strategic piece in there as well so that actually you evolve that food value chain over time so that those more strategic factors are also taken into account. Great. Thank you, Richard. I think looking at our list of questions, I think we've got to the end of those now. So thank you, everybody, for um uh, for being so open and sending us uh, sending us some questions to consider. If you do have any more, please forward them to any of the the, the panelists. We'll make um, contact details available when these um, uh, slides are um, are shared with um, with participants. Um, uh, in this case, I think I'll hand over back to David Adamson, who will um, start to draw the uh, the session to a close. Thank you, James. Thank you for orchestrating that so well, uh, and the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, it was Tim King. Actually, I don't believe we answered Tim King's question. It's a wonderful question. But unfortunately, we don't have time for it. Uh, there was a few other ones we didn't have time for it too. But um, for the panelists, what Tim King, I'll just quote him. He said, the collective experience of the panel is truly impressive. And they, they have such tremendous and fascinating insight into the current situation that we're facing. Uh, you know, I couldn't have closed better. 
and to support him on that. But I will say thank you to the attendees as well, because these webinars wouldn't be successful without your active participation. And uh, the, the session, as, as James and others have said, they, it will be recorded. And in the, um, the three standards that have been mentioned, and uh, Amanda put the URL in the chat box. If you just Google the BSI response to COVID-19, you'll be able to download those. Um, they'll be free. And I think it's till the end of June or was it July? I'm not quite sure, but a, a period of time for you to download those and absorb those. And um, that brings us to a close right on time. So guys, thank you very much indeed once again. And, and thank everybody else. I'll close this. And so stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thank you.